Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Space News Pod. This is a show about SpaceX, NASA, and spaceflight. I'm your host, Will Walden. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about SpaceX's super heavy starship, IFT-4 launch, and the mission. And right now, let's talk about what's going on right now. The ship has been tested. They've been static fire numerous times. And the latest static fire, full duration, single engine, uh, Raptor engine static fire, looked great. Looked great. There were some tiles missing afterwards, though. So what they're going to be doing is moving the ship back to the production facility. And they're going to check on the tiles. They're going to check on the internal plumbing. They're going to check on everything that happened during the static fires and go through the data, sift through all the data, and then get this rocket ready to go on top of the booster. Now, the booster still needs testing as well. It needs to do a full duration 33 Raptor engine static fire. That takes about 15 seconds for the full entire static fire. And it's about 7.9 million pounds of thrust. That's 3,600 metric tons of thrust. And this rocket's clamped down. So it doesn't launch into the air. It's just on the pad and it does the static fire. Has to check out all the plumbing, all the electronics, make sure all the Raptor engines work perfectly fine so SpaceX can launch this on the IFT-4 mission. Now let's go back a little bit. IFT-3. IFT-3, successful mission. Uh, some people say it's not because they don't know what they're talking about. But the successful mission was um, they have milestones to reach. SpaceX has milestones to reach. So successful stage separation, huge deal for SpaceX. IFT-3's booster did a little flip move, started coming back down to Earth. They had to blow it up. It wasn't meant for this world anymore. That's okay. That's how SpaceX operates. It's called iterative design. They learn from every mistake that they make. They learn from every explosion of the rocket. So IFT-3, that booster blowing up on its way back down to soft land in the Gulf of Mexico, totally fine. That's part of the process. Part of the process. And then the ship went on did a uh, a door test for the Starlink satellites. Totally fine. Everything worked pretty good. It looked like the door was closing a little bit slow on the way um, back in, kind of like it didn't look really super smooth. So between IFT3, IFT4, IFT5, IFT6, et cetera, they're going to work on that door and make it perfect. They need it to be perfect in order for them to launch thousands of Starlink satellites per year into low Earth orbit so they can provide Starlink service to millions and millions of people around the world and make cash flow so they can so they can continue building the starships down to Starbase Texas. Okay. So IFT3 completely fine out of the way. They also blew up the ship <clears throat> down the line. It was coming back in um for a soft landing in the Indian Ocean and that's where it was supposed to be, but they blew it up. Uh something happened, they blew it up. Um and then that's fine too. So let's go on to IFT4. What are they going to do for IFT4? They're going to do basically the same thing as IFT-3. What they want to accomplish is they want to launch the booster and the rocket. Of course, they want to clear the pad, clear the tower. Everything's fine. Full launch. They want, they want to do a soft landing of the booster this time. I've heard in the grapevine some SpaceX employees saying, hey, we're going to work really hard on getting the booster to land in the Gulf of Mexico. It's okay if it blows up, but we're working hard to get this thing to flip to maintain stability, be upright, and get ready for the landing, the soft landing in the Gulf of Mexico. They really want to work on that. And they are working on that because that would be a huge milestone for SpaceX. Now, on top of that, what do they do in IFT-3? They said they did the payload door. They're going to do a, a fuel transfer in the ship um, and also re-entry for the ship as well. And some other things in there that we're not privy to. So they're testing other um, <clears throat> systems within the ship itself. So they're testing these systems. And this is stuff that nobody really knows about because it's internal SpaceX stuff. So we nobody's going to know about that stuff. So what are they going to focus on this time? Well, there's an important thing that SpaceX posted the other day. They did the single Raptor engine fire, the test fire, the static fire using the header tanks on the ship for IFT-4. Now, they're going to get all the way to the end of this 
to the Indian Ocean. Whoa, he almost knocked off my water bottle. To the Indian Ocean. And they want to soft land this thing in the Indian Ocean. And they're working hard to get to that point. But Elon Musk posted something on Twitter X the other day after this single Raptor engine static fire. So SpaceX posted static fire of a single Raptor engine using the Hatter tanks on Flight 4 Starship. Elon Musk posted right after that. He reposted that and he said, getting ready for Flight 4 of Starship, exclamation point, super excited. Goal of this mission is for Starship to get through max re-entry heating with all systems functional. Okay, what does that mean? Max re-entry heating. They want to almost burn this thing up. They want to make sure that the heat tiles work, basically. And then all the systems within the ship continue to work on its way for a soft landing. All the plumbing, nothing can burn up. They can't have any extra heat. So these heat tiles have to work. And like we saw during this Raptor, single Raptor engine static fire, some of the heat tiles came off. Some came off. And during IFT3, some of the heat tiles came off during the launch. And we could see people picking up these heat tiles on the beach uh, real close to Starbase. So I've seen dozens of these things fall off during these flights. Now, is it going to be okay? That's the big question. Is it going to be okay? Well, nobody knows for certain. But they have to make sure that these tiles stay on because any tile that doesn't stay on, introduces heat to the interior and the exterior of the Starship. The exterior, stainless steel, it's it's pretty tough. It's pretty tough. But eventually, with the max heat, as uh, Elon said, the max re-entry heating, uh, it might burn through the ship or at least make it so hot where that heat tile fell off that it interrupts some of the systems. It could be a navigation system, could be a fuel system, could be any part of electronics in there that guides the ship wherever it's going to go. Now, the, the main thing here is if they get this, if they nail this, if they absolutely nail this reentry and figure out the heating tiles, which is the hardest part. It seems like the hardest part for SpaceX is keeping these tiles out at this point. This is going to be a game changer because if they can get through max reentry, there's a chance. There's a slight chance. The SpaceX could soft land this in the Indian Ocean. And if that's the case, if they can soft land this in the Indian Ocean, it would be a game changer for SpaceX. It would be a game changer for space flight. And this, this is a huge deal, a huge, huge deal. If they can soft land this. This is the first step. This is one of the first steps, I should say. This, I guess the fourth step towards landing at Starbase. They're currently building... Tower 2 at Starbase, which will be their catch tower. Uh, the tower right now is their launch. They have a launch tower and they're going to have a, a catch tower. So right now they're using the launch tower to launch these rockets. And then Tower 2 will be their catch tower. So when they bring rockets back to Starship, they don't want to blow up the systems that launch the rockets because that would put them six months to a year behind schedule. They don't want to do that. So they're building Tower 2. And what they're doing now with these uh, IFT2, IFT3, IFT4, IFT5, if they can soft land these and figure out pinpoint accuracy. Remember, it took them X amount of number of launches for Falcon to land, right? So this is an order of magnitude huger than Falcon. So it's going to be a tough, a tough engineering problem to solve, to land this thing. And it's going to probably take them 10 flights to get it like really good. You know, they're probably going to get a few where they're, where they, where it looks great and they will do a soft landing in the Indian ocean and in the Gulf of Mexico. But realistically, they're not going to have this tower done for a while, for months and months, probably by the end of the year, they'll have it in a really good spot, but they don't, they don't need all of the electronics and they don't need all of the piping and they don't need all of the launch hardware for the launch tower one. And they're taking pieces from the launch tower at Kennedy space center and bringing them over to Texas. So this landing tower catch tower uh, can be functional. So these parts are already built and all they have to do is kind of like Lego. You just assemble them at this point, put the pieces together, make sure it works properly. And then if that's the case, uh, just go for it. You know, uh, 
once they figure out these soft landings in the Gulf and in the Indian Ocean and get them to pinpoint accuracy because they have to they have to do a flight pattern too. So it's not like they just go up and come down. They have to go up across, fly across, fly across and get to the towers land vertically like a falcon, like a falcon rocket. Arms wide open for these catch towers. And then as the booster slowly floats down towards the tower, these arms close. It's it's going to be miraculous. You know, as it's coming down, as it's breaking through um, the atmosphere, as it's going through clouds, and you can see it adjusting itself, uh, the, the tower arms will be closing. It's going to be a miraculous thing. This is going to change space flight. It's going to change humanity, I think, because if this rocket can send people to the moon, can send people to Mars, if they figure this out, rapid reusability, full reusability of a rocket, never been done. If they can figure this out, it's going to drastically uh, lower the cost of space flight for everybody. Um, not only for SpaceX, but for all of the customers, people like NASA, people that are sending things to the moon, people sending things to low earth orbit, people that are sending things to the outer solar system. And then we'll have more things in space and who knows what people will build. There's a possibility people will build landers for other planets. Though so just as a the thing is, as long as you can make money with it, right? So somebody like intuitive machines, who's uh, building lunar landers for NASA and the Artemis program, they're going to make money. They don't just make money off the landers. They make money off possible mining on the moon. So if they can find if loot, if intuitive machines can find rare earth minerals on the moon and figure out a way to mine them and bring them back. Um, you know, what happens is you don't, like the people, okay, so the gold rush. Okay, so this, this is a little bit off topic, but still on topic. The gold rush, right? The most money that people made weren't uh, wasn't from the actual gold. It was from the infrastructure that they build to actually mine the gold, right? So like these big corporations came in and they built gold mines. They started mining the gold and basically built the shovels that dug the, dug the gold mines. So people that were just prospectors and they're like, Hey, I'm going to go out West and I'm going to get this gold. Uh, the person building the shovel, selling them the shovel made more money than the people getting the gold. Basically that's, you know, that's, that's basically how this is. So if they're intuitive machines, uh, they have, they're building a Rover too for NASA. So what they have is they have a Rover that will drive around on the moon doing whatever intuitive machines wants it to do until somebody buys time on it. It's like they're Ubering on the moon, basically. They're like, hey, NASA's like, hey, we want to like transport some people for the Artemis program uh, from point A to point B. Uh, how much money is that going to be for X amount of time? Intuitive machines get paid by NASA to do that. So this is going to open up a huge infrastructure for space flight and exploration for not just us either. Intuitive machines can charge other countries or other, um, you know, other companies for this time. And it could be for landers. They could charge money for landing. They could charge. And it's like, it's not just intuitive machines. It could be hundreds of companies doing this. So not just one company can do this. Intuitive machines is a good uh, example because they do have the infrastructure started already. And they already have landers that are launching to the moon. But in the future, there could be numerous companies doing this with different kinds of architecture. Um, the intuitive machines um, vehicle is going to be the size of a Ford F-150 truck. So shipping cargo on the moon surface, shipping people around, get your Uber on the moon. And this is the Starship is opening up this infrastructure. So this is the first, the first little step, first little step. We're here for it. We're here for it. I'm here for it. I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it too. Um, let me know in the comments. What do you think IFT4 is going to be all about? Elon, they're focused on max re-entry heating. Make sure nothing happens to the to the ship when it re-enters. But what else do you think they're going to be doing? 
there's some internal stuff that they're doing that they don't tell anybody about, but it's, you know, it's, it's engineering and making sure that the rocket functions properly, etc. Also, if you like space flight, please take a second and hit the subscribe button because not only will you get this channel in your feed, you're going to get a bunch of other space flight channels. And also, if you like this video too, like this video and subscribe, you're not just going to get me, but you're going to get other people that you probably didn't even know about in your feed. So that'll keep coming through. You'll find some really cool people and get some really great space flight news. So I want to say thanks to everybody out there who's been enjoying the show. If you have, please hit the sub button. If you really like it, become a member. Become a member. Become part of the pod squad and join up. Help us out. Help me continue making these shows every single week. And that's about it for today, guys. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. I got I to point there because it's a it's a YouTuber thing, right? You got down there. Hit that like button with maximum dynamic pressure. And I'll see you in the next one.